Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining us today. As you can see, the webinar topic is recent changes and new complexities in credit reporting. It's certainly a very, very timely topic. Um, I'm Maggie Watkins. I'm Senior Client Services Director uh, for Womble Bond Dickinson, and I work very closely with our three California offices. And we are so pleased to be partnering once again with the Association of Corporate Counsel. Thank you so much uh, to them for letting us um, work alongside them. We've really appreciated this relationship and look forward to doing more of these kinds of programs together. Before we get started, let me just uh, tell you a few housekeeping items. We are recording today's presentation, a copy of the slides, and it, of the recording will be circulated to all of those attendees. And you need to give us uh, probably, I would say, about a week, might be a little bit less. We've been doing a number of these webinars recently. So uh, give us a little bit of time, but we will be sending that out to you and you will have that available. Also, uh, this program is going to be available for CLE credit. If you signed in with your bar number and you are in California, um, we will take care of it from our end and send you a certificate. If you happen to be from outside of California, then you will want to have, um, you know, you want to reach out to us, probably me, I think I'm on the invitation, and we will take care of that for you. If you do have any questions today, we will certainly um, try to answer as many of them as we can. There is a Q&A box on the right-hand side, so feel free to use that. And as I say, we'll try to get to as many as we can before the end. And then I guess the last thing that's worth noting is in this crazy environment that we're in, um, we're all adjusting to the, the technologies. Uh, let me just tell you, I've had issues this morning and with everything from frozen screens, drop, drop screens, and now we've got rolling blackout possibilities. Uh, anything can happen, but hopefully nothing will happen. And uh, just know that if anything does, we will try to do our best to take care of it as quickly as we can. So at this time, what I would like to do is introduce today's moderator, Artine Betpera. Artine is a partner in our Irvine office, and he brings over a decade of experience to bear on complex litigation problems. He manages significant volumes of individual and class action litigation for some of the country's largest banks and financial institutions. Artine is a thought leader who frequently writes and presents on issues important to the financial services industry, including cutting edge legal issues arising from consumer protection statutes. With that, Artine, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Maggie, and welcome everyone. Good afternoon. We are all very excited for the opportunity uh, to provide what we hope will be uh, an interesting and insightful presentation um, regarding credit reporting requirements, uh, as well as some uh, changes that we expect to happen uh, in terms of litigation and laws arising out of our current financial crisis. Um, what I'll do is I'll take a moment to introduce our panelists today. Uh, I'll run through an overview of what the, uh, of the topics that we will be covering, and then we'll go ahead and kind of get into the meat of the, meat of the, the um, presentation here today. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce our panelist, John Alzheimer. John is the president of the Alzheimer Group and founder of the Cre uh, of Credit Expert Witness. He's a nationally recognized expert on, on credit reporting. I've had the pleasure of presenting with John in the past, and he really, really knows what he's talking about when it comes to credit reporting. Uh, John has uh, served as an expert witness or legal consultant in credit-related litigation over 400 times. He's been qualified and admitted as an expert in federal and state court. Um, he's held positions with Equifax, uh, Fair Isaac, Credit.com, and has had years of experience working with numerous consumer credit-related companies. And I am very confident that you're going to find what he has to say to be incredibly interesting uh, and insightful. Uh, John, welcome uh, to our presentation. Uh, we're glad to have you. Thank you, Arne. Um, I'll, um, I'll also uh, I'm very uh, pleased to uh, introduce uh, my colleague and someone who I am very proud to call my partner, Kristen walker Probst. Kristen is an experienced and exceptional trial lawyer and civil litigator. She has tried over 100 cases in both state and federal court 
uh, as well as cases involving the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which we will be discussing in depth today. Kristen also has a broad litigation background, including areas of financial services, general business litigation, personal injury, and labor and employment. And Kristen is also an adjunct trial advocacy professor at Loyola Law School, where she teaches in the area of trial skills and evidence. Kristen, welcome to the presentation. Thank you, Artie. All right, give me a moment here. I'm just uh, advancing the slide. So we'll give you an overview and then we'll get started. As Maggie mentioned, we do have technical glitches sometimes, including delays and oftentimes glitches in the matrix. So bear with us here. It looks like uh, we got everything up and running. So uh, there are four main bases that we're going to cover here in our uh, presentation today. Starting out at first base, I think it will behoove us all to quickly orient and kind of refresh ourselves as to the basic requirements under FICRA and how the general credit reporting and credit dispute process works. Once we round first, we'll head into second base. We'll, we'll talk about common claims under FICRA. We'll talk about litigation exposure, some nuanced issues surrounding FICRA litigation, as well as litigation strategies for both uh, discovery and trial. Uh, once we hit second base, we're going to charge into third, where we're going to talk about recent changes to the Fair Credit Reporting Act, uh, including recent changes under CARES, some new CFPB guidance, uh, rounding third, we're going to head into home where we will have a general uh, and I believe very interesting discussion about how the financial crisis in 2008 could inform us of what's to come in 2020 to 2021. And I think this is going to be a, a very interesting part of our conversation since uh, between myself, Kristen, and John, you have three veterans of the uh, prior financial crisis. So I'm hoping we've got some great insight uh, to bear on this issue for you today. Okay, so let's start with our first topic, which is a general overview of FICRA. Um, to start, what I'll do is I'll, is I'll ask you, Kristen, um, can you tell us from a legal perspective generally what FICRA regulates? Sure, um, so obviously it's a federal statute and it regulates basically the maintenance collection um, the, the first bullet up there is actually perfect, um, and disclosure of personal information. Um, and who it regulates includes the credit reporting agencies. Um, commonly, you would know it as Experian or Equifax or TransUnion, and also the furnishers of information, um, the servicers or um, financial institutions typically that would report uh, the consumer's debt out to the credit reporting agencies. It also, although not litigated nearly as frequently, regulates third parties when they pull someone's credit report. It regulates the purpose by which they pull it for. Thank you, Kristen. So kind of filling that out, John, let me get your expert perspective. Let's talk a little bit about the credit reporting ecosystem in general. Can you give us a brief overview of what that ecosystem looks like uh, as it relates to what's regulated by the Fair Credit Reporting Act? Sure. So the, the consumer credit reporting ecosystem is made up of a lot of moving parts, and the participants in the ecosystem have grown over time. I, I think if you went and asked consumers, you know, what makes up the credit environment, they would probably say lenders and maybe credit reporting agencies. Uh, and and it's, it's considerably more than that. You certainly have um, consumers who are borrowers who are protected by provision of the Federal Credit Reporting Act, which defines what their rights are vis-a-vis -vis disputing information, um, restricting access to their credit reports under certain scenarios, um, free copies of credit reports from time to time, and then, there, and then other more, more, I guess, less frequently discussed rights that they enjoy. But you also have companies that um, redistribute or buy and resell information from the big three repositories. And these are companies that are commonly referred to as either resellers, 
in the mortgage environment, they're referred to as mortgage reporting companies. And so they'll essentially buy reports from the big three, um, merge them together, kind of cosmetically adjust the information and then distribute that normally to mortgage brokers or lenders for underwriting purposes. And then you have companies uh, that uh, are kind of informally referred to as freemium websites. And these are the credit karmas of the world and the credit.coms and the mints and the credit sesames that essentially have agreements with the credit reporting agencies to buy large chunks of information from them and then turn around and give it away to consumers at no cost in exchange for them becoming registered users of their websites. Um, just a, a, an interesting piece of information, Credit Karma, which does not have a fee-based service on their website, just sold to Intuit for over $7 billion. And so in, in, in their scenario, anyways, free, certainly paid. Um, and so you, you, you certainly have a, a lot of companies that are either um, covered by the provisions of the FCRA, consumers protected by the provisions of the FCRA, or, or companies that are tangential to the FCRA, like Fair Isaac and Vantage Score Solutions, which are generally recognized as credit scoring related companies. They're not credit reporting agencies. They're certainly not consumers, but certainly their products are covered um, in the act, especially as it pertains to things like adverse action requirements and disclosure, credit score disclosure notices um, for mortgage applicants. And so the ecosystem tends to get larger and larger as time goes on uh, and, and um, lots of moving parts. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, so I kind of wanted to drill down a, a little bit into some of the legal and then operational aspects of, of FICRA, um, particularly as it might relate um, to a large portion of our audience members. Um, let me go ahead and advance to the next slide here. Okay. Um, and obviously the audience heard from, from both Kristen and John uh, about how FICRA regulates a, a good bit of, of reporting consumer credit. And from my perspective, I think a very important legal aspect of, of FICRA in terms of determining where business intersects with the law is, is understanding what a consumer report is. And so I kind of like to do the same thing here. Uh, Kristen, let, I want to get your view in terms of the, the legal aspect of this. And then John, have you kind of comment um, from, from the business, business side of things. Um, so, so Kristen, can you speak to the legal side of this? Is a consumer report uh, that's regulated under FICRA, something that's specifically defined? And if so, what are the elements or characteristics of a consumer report and, and why is this important? Well, so we have them up there. Um, some important elements of a consumer report in terms of litigation under FICRA though, is the report needs to be prepared by a consumer reporting agency. So not some third party that has multiple levels of hearsay. And for purposes of FICRA litigation, it, need, it excludes uh, a report that's prepared solely for the purpose of the consumer. So if it's for the consumer only, for instance, if you were to go pull your credit report and it's not for purposes of a third party or a furnisher or a lender looking at it, it doesn't qualify in terms of FICRA um, in terms of litigation. The other interesting part about what's excluded under FICRA and also under the companion CCRAA, California statute, is if a consumer report is concerning a consumer's eligibility for commercial purposes. So sometimes you would have an individual that, for instance, has an S Corp or somehow they conduct business and their report is for purposes arguably of commercial, that is excluded under FICRA. It needs to be for purposes of um, personal credit. Great. So it sounds like there, there is some, some measure of nuance here in determining what is a consumer report for purposes of FICRA regulation. So, John, let me ask you, from your perspective, um, can you give us some examples of the most common forms of a consumer report that uh, typically arise in the course of, say, litigation matters? Sure, sure. And, and, and it's you know, the, these reports, which are, I think, commonly referred to as credit reports, uh, which is a category or a, an example of a consumer report. If you, if you look through the Fair Credit Reporting Act, you're not going to find the reference to a credit report anywhere in the act. It refers to them as, as consumer reports. And of course, a credit report is, a, is an example of a consumer report, but certainly not the only example of a consumer report. In, in my world, in the credit reporting world, 
the the credit there are actually two types of reports that find their way into litigation um, either in the discovery process or evidence of damages or, or, or as part of the document production and that is a a true credit report and so i use that term kind of emphatically for a reason because a, a credit report is a credit report that is used by a lender or a service provider or a credit card issuer for the purposes of underwriting. So this would be the type of report that Wells Fargo would purchase or that Ford Motor Credit would purchase or that Chase Manhattan Bank would purchase for the purpose of underwriting. Those reports are not available to consumers. And then you have another style of report, which is the consumer disclosure. And so this is the type of report that I can go get at annualcreditreport.com or off of the Experian website or off of the Equifax or TransUnion websites. So these are the reports that still come from the repository but are designed to be given to a consumer. They're cosmetically easier to read for a consumer. They're color coded. There's a legend that explains what all these different characters and fields mean. And those types of reports are not used for underwriting, meaning that a lender or some sort of a service provider does not get those reports. And so there, there definitely is this delineation between a disclosure and a credit report. The third type, which uh, finds its way into litigation quite a bit, is what's referred to as an RMCR, or Residential Mortgage Credit Report. And those credit reports are um, essentially a combination of credit reports that belong to a consumer or a consumer plus a co-applicant. So if I go to apply for a loan somewhere with a, a mortgage lender or a mortgage broker, they're going to pull my residential mortgage credit report, which is informally referred to as either a tri merge or a mortgage credit report. It's all the same thing. And essentially, they're pulling information from all three of the big repositories, merging it, and then they you know, usually reorganize the information. And then that's what's used as part, as part of the underlying process. And if you have two applicants, if you have an applicant and a co-applicant, then it's essentially the combination of six credit reports that go into that residential mortgage credit reports. And then, fortunately or unfortunately, whichever side of the argument you're on, um, I, I do see quite a bit of these credit report summaries, which you can pull off of these premium websites, the dot coms, uh, that consumers have free access to periodically. You do see a lot of that information making its way in litigation, and, and, and that's problematic. And here's why it's problematic: it's it's at least two degrees of separation away from the furnishing party. So when you look at your disclosure credit report or you're looking at a credit report off of some website somewhere, it's not really the information that was provided to the credit reporting agencies by the bank or by the credit union or by the credit card issuer. It's one or two degrees of separation away from the information that was actually provided. And so um, the, the, the way the information is characterized, some of the dates associated with the information are not necessarily dates that were furnished by a lender or some sort of data furnisher and so but nonetheless those are ones that are very easy for consumers to get because they're they're heavily marketed and and they're free um and you can get them much more frequently than you can normally get in the normal non-covid world that you can get your credit reports directly from reporting agencies i know that the, the frequency has ramped up to once a week now um, through april of next year but generally You'll, you'll see a lot of those freemium style disclosure reports making into litigation as well. Okay, the, very insightful, John. I mean, I think it's great to have kind of this overview of the different categories of, of credit reports or, 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 or pseudo credit reports or disclosures that drive a lot of the FICRA litigation. Um, but when I think it would be helpful, and I'll stay on you for this topic, um, which is our next slide, um, you know, we talked about the, the types of reports, but why don't you kind of help us walk through some of the nuts and bolts of, of how that information actually makes its way onto the reports, um, both with respect to uh, the reporting of credit um, and then as well as kind of how the credit dispute process works from a functional perspective. Sure, absolutely, happy to. So the, the overwhelming majority of information that appears on any of your credit reports is furnished to the credit reporting agencies by organizations that are referred to as data furnishers. And that's going to be your banks, that's going to be your credit unions, that's going to be your credit card issuers, that's going to be your debt collectors. Uh, depending on who you believe, I think the CFPB published a study a while ago that indicated there were over 10,000 companies that fit that definition. I've actually seen um, information from other um, reputable sources that indicate that number is considerably larger 
than 10,000 furnishers. And so they normally on a monthly basis will send information about their customers, if you will, to one, two, or all three of the consumer credit reporting agencies. And whatever is sent in that month overlays what was sent in the prior month. And so usually things like balances, dates, payments, um, that type of information is gonna overlay the information that was sent the prior month. That information then goes, I always use the swimming pool analogy when I'm trying to explain this to a jury. Uh, all this information goes into a gigantic swimming pool and that information kind of floats around in there until a user of information like a bank or a credit card issuer wants to access your credit report for some reason, usually for underwriting and risk assessment. And so the, uh, the consumer would fill out an application, the lender would make a consumer, or to a credit inquiry into the credit reporting agency's database. The credit reporting agency would then dive into the pool with the net and find every piece of information in the pool that is associated with that particular consumer using very sophisticated matching logic. And once it pulls all that information out of this massive credit file database, it compiles it into the report. It then scores it, usually with either a scoring model built by FICA or Vantage Score, and then delivers that information to the user. And then they get to do whatever they need to do with it, usually for risk assessment. If the consumer feels that the information on that report is incorrect, they obviously have the right to file a dispute. And consumers will generally file a dispute with the credit reporting agencies or with the furnisher or with both. Um, they can do it any way they'd like to do it. When they do it with a consumer reporting agency, that is referred to as an indirect dispute because it is indirectly disputing information provided by a different party, in this case, the data furniture. So instead of going directly to the bank to file a dispute, we're getting to the bank indirectly through one of the credit reporting agencies. The credit reporting agencies are going to homogenize or distill the consumer's dispute down into a code which represents or captures the nature of the consumer's dispute. And then they're going to place this information on a form, and that form is called an ACDV or an Automated Consumer Dispute Verification Form. And it is going to be magically transmitted over a communication protocol called eOSCAR. And it is essentially going to become available for the furnisher to log into eOSCAR and see all the disputes that are pending by consumers that are disputing trade lines or collection accounts that that company has furnished. And then they're going to quote unquote work the dispute. They're going to perform their investigation and they're, they're going to respond back on the same ACDB form through eOSCAR back to the consumer reporting agency with the results of the investigation. That, you know, that kind of acts like a work order. If you go to a, a garage to have something done to your car, they're going to print out a work order and the mechanics are going to follow the order on the work order and they're going to fix your car. So the credit reporting agencies are going to do the exact same thing. They're either going to remove something, they're going to change something, or they're going to leave it as is if the item has been corrected. And then they're going to carbon copy the other reporting agencies to make sure that your credit reports are accurate across the entire landscape of credit reporting agencies. That's indirect. If the consumer decides, you know what, I'm gonna circumvent the credit reporting agencies, I wanna go directly to my credit union to file a dispute, fine. That's called a direct dispute because you're going directly to the furnishing party. Again, similar actions happen. The furnishing party performs their investigation. Once they're done, then they are going to proactively reach out to any of the credit reporting agencies that they report to using a different form, and that form is called an Automated Universal Data Form, or an AUD. They're still going to send it over the eOSCAR system, but they're going to send it to all the reporting agencies that they sent the allegedly incorrect information to initially, and then that ensures that it's corrected across the board. When this is done, when this process is done, um, and the, the trade association of the credit reporting agencies has indicated and actually has testified in front of Congress multiple times that this entire process that I've just explained takes about two weeks, uh, give, give or take, depending on the scenario. But the, the consumer then is going to receive uh, a, a communication from the credit reporting agency indicating the results of the investigation, and then that generally closes the door on the, on the dispute process. The, the really interesting stuff. I mean, we're talking about so, – it's, it's really, to me, interesting to think about what a massive amount of data all of this – uh, encompasses. I love the way that you describe it as a, as a big swimming pool of data. And it's just so easy to kind of visualize how what is undoubtedly a very complex and sophisticated process work, John. I think you do such a great job of really distilling down the nuts and bolts of it all. Now, from a litigator's perspective, um, I, I think to myself, like, 
how do I get this through discovery? And how do I present this information to a jury? So Kristen, let me, let me turn to you. Um, from your experience with FICRA and both the discovery process and the trial, can you talk about some of your strategies in making sure that you have the evidence and the witnesses that you need to defend against claims of, of a FICRA environment with this kind of nuts and bolts background in mind? Sure. Well, first I need John, which <laughs> I'm kidding, but I'm not. Um, I've used John on several cases. Um, and so I mean it when I say though, you need an expert and you need an expert rather early in the case to help you look through your own policies and procedures, your clients, I suppose, as well as um, to identify any potential problems and arguments against those problems, as well as what plaintiff's looking at. So early on, I try to line up an expert and the expert looking down the road, because trial sort of what I'm always looking at at the end of the day, um, they need to be able to explain things like John did in a way that we're not just talking about X's and O's and P's and Q's, because that's going to go like this for the jury most of the time and everybody's going to glaze over. And so this whole process, ACDV, AUD, alphabet soup, has to be explained very practically. Um, so beyond the expert, what is a little bit harder to find sometimes is generally I need two PMKs or PMQs, depending on your generation. Um, I need a witness within the client's landscape that understands the credit reporting part of their business and how things got reported, where those employees are located. A lot of times those are outsourced. So there needs to be an employee that I can designate as the credit reporting PMQ that can explain um, in deposition and then to a jury how their process works. And then separately, because one of the big issues in credit reporting is, was the information accurate? Was it reported accurately? That's a separate issue. That's gonna be sort of a business line person to explain why it was reported the way it was from an accounting perspective and how the business works if in fact we're gonna to try to defend on accuracy. So um, sometimes it's difficult to find a person, especially that credit reporting PMK at the client level that is going to be deposition worthy for lack of a better word, who's going to present well and not talk sort of robotically. They need to be likable and credible, I always say, if they're gonna be in front of a jury um, and they just might be if they're in deposition. Um, also making sure that you're collecting um, because one of the main ways to defend these cases is on causation and damages. Almost universally, there's two categories I see. Either somebody never pays their debt and then they're shocked and dismayed that they've got a bad credit score. And so um, that case is maybe a little bit easier to defend because I say cases are about good guys and bad guys at a jury level almost universally. And so if you've got someone that never paid on their debt, it's going to be a little bit easier to convince a jury that, well, maybe they deserved the credit score. But the other category is given all sort of the, the soup that John explained and the multiple layers and frankly, the individuals that are inputting the information onto the ACDV, there is room for manual error. And oftentimes what I see is a case where there was a minor error and because this gets reported frequently, sometimes that same error or a related error gets repeated. But for to be really crass, it really didn't matter uh, it, in the end game. It, that, that reporting error in terms of, let's say, they said, well, they paid you know, $250 instead of $232 or something like that. It didn't matter in terms of the consumer being damaged. Um, but in order to see that, you have to look at the nexus between what the reporting was versus what they're claiming their damage was. And so there needs to be a nexus on when they applied for credit versus when that reporting occurred. And really the only way to do that is to go get the discovery and ask them in written discovery and in depositions, when did you apply for credit? When was the adverse action taken against you? And then you need to collect that information and compare it with the ACDV dates. Oftentimes they don't match and there's no nexus. Okay. Now, Kristen, one of the, in, in, in my world, in the expert witness world, that is ineffectionally referred to as the pay window. 
And so you have this period of time that something is allegedly incorrect on a credit report, and, and, we're, and we're in federal court, we're not in the California version of the FCRA, and the consumer files a dispute, allegedly can't get something corrected, and then that's when kind of people believe that this metaphorical pay window begins because that's when damages are essentially running and that it goes until some period of time where the consumer either is able to get an item corrected, able to get an item removed or get an item suppressed where the pay window now closes. And so essentially the expert's job, one of one of the things that, that we're tasked with often is to identify what that pay window actually is and ensure that something actually happened in an actionable period of time rather than outside of the actionable period of time. I don't know if you knew that about us. Yeah, and, and what I frequently see is you find out when the plaintiff's attorney was hired and then all of a sudden, this is my cynical view, the plaintiff goes on a frenzy of, of applications because they're gonna get denied because their credit's not good. And, and then they want that nexus to be there and then they start disputing so there'll be an ACDV around that time period. Yep. Um, they're so planting the flowers. Is, mm -hmm. What other stuff do they have going on? What other bad marks do they have on their credit report that may have caused them to be denied other than just this frenzy of applications to Home Depot all of a sudden? And I think, Kristen, that's, that's so great. And I think what it highlights is, is the need to really take each individual case and have the capability of, of drilling down where you need to. Uh, in order to fully develop your case, um, particularly where you have those issues of causation, which we're actually going to get into into the slide after this. But before that we do that, Kristen, let me stay on you here for a second. Um, you know, we've talked about uh, evidence. We've talked about, um, you know, uh, key witnesses and things like that. Just briefly, if we can, in, in your experience, can you tell us a little bit about where you see the most common types of claims arising um, under FICRA? And, and if you have any sort of insights you can share with the audience um, about that. Sure. So, um, you know, there's basically three claims. You've got them up there. The first um, is related to you, you have an obligation uh, to report accurately. Um, and so if the consumer thinks that whatever's on their credit report is not accurate, they arguably have an action under that first prong. That's related to, by the way, the California CCRAA um, claim that they might bring. The second is regarding the investigation. So this whole ACDV thing we talked about, if the consumer directly uh, disputes, I mean indirectly disputes with the CRA, the CRA then goes back to the furnisher and says confirm this or tell us it's different and they have an obligation, the furnisher does at that point, to go reasonably investigate the claim and if they find out the information was being reported inaccurately to correct it. Um, the third one is how you pull the credit, the consumer report, what purpose. Um, we looked, and this is my anecdotal experience too, I have never even come close to trying a case under that third one. It's just not litigated nearly as much. The first two are almost neck and neck, um, whether or not the claim is for a uh, failure to reasonably investigate after the consumer disputes or that the information was not reported accurately. Those are about uh, neck and neck. And we looked in California just this year, there's been 307 cases filed under FICRA. That doesn't necessarily include the companion CCRAA. Although often if I'm in federal court with a FICRA claim in California, there's also a CCRAA claim. Um, yeah. So those are, those, are the, those are the two main ones. Just wanna highlight for that second one. And often they go together, frankly, because they're two different things. One, you've gotta report the information accurately. And then if the consumer disputes, you have an obligation to go reasonably investigate. Um, okay. Interestingly, um, if they directly dispute, meaning they go to the bank, the furnisher of information, it doesn't count. So that's a big area to defend. It doesn't count for purposes of FICRA litigation. It has to be an indirect dispute with the consumer reporting agency. The consumer has to initiate that. If not, they don't meet one of the elements under that second type of claim. Got it, okay. Um, so, and let me just, before we move on, quickly throw it to, to John. John, is this more or less cons uh, consistent with your perspective in terms of what aspects of credit reporting operations or functions spawn the most common legal disputes? 
Yeah, the the failure to maintain procedures is certainly probably top of the list. I, I will tell you that, um, I mean, not that my experience is statistically representative of the entire landscape of Fair Credit Reporting Act lawsuits, but I, I would say that probably 15 to 20 percent of, of my of my work is permissible purpose uh, or permissible purpose claims. And while while the impact of an inquiry, and that's generally the the, the byproduct of a of a of an um, impermissible access claim, and that's the damage that's the damage allegation is you left an inquiry on my credit report and I didn't give you permission to access my credit and therefore my credit score has gone down. Um, that's a very easy one to rebut uh, because that's either factually inaccurate in most cases or the impact is so minor that it can easily be um, kind of uh, uh, buried underneath other more problematic aspects of the consumer's credit. And but I will tell you that I think plaintiffs attorneys and, and this is not a pejorative statement about them. This is actually kind of a compliment. They're very creative. And, and, and I think that they realize that you know, they're not going to make a lot of hay claiming that my score went down two points because of an inquiry and therefore I couldn't get a, I couldn't get a mortgage. So now I'm seeing more and more of the, well, I'm emotionally distressed because of this, because I'm worried that someone has access to my information. And every day we see news about data breaches and now my information can be out there floating around in the ether and I have no control over it. So I'm seeing more and more damage claims being more specific to kind of the emotional distress aspect of it than it is about the actual credit damage component of it. And of course, that's that's probably smart because I don't know of many credit experts that all have also have the medical background or the training to be able to opine as to things like emotional distress. I certainly avoid that because I, I that's not my specialty. Yeah. And John, I think that's a really perfect segue into our next topic here. Um, which is to talk a little bit about the exposure under FICRA um, and damages. And I think one of the um, most critical dividing lines uh, when it comes to the potential exposure a company might face for a FICRA violation is between the two types of violations that can occur under the Act, the negligent violation and, and a willful violation. And like many other consumer protection statutes, um, the FICRA draws that same line, that you have your negligent or your standard violation, and then something that will result in a considerable enhancement of exposure uh, for damages under that statute. So let me um, kind of, since this is primarily really um, uh, involves a lot of legal issues, Kristen, let me, let me call on you. Um, can you talk a little bit about this distinction and, and why is it so important and how the rules under FICRA are unique uh, when it comes to triggering heightened or punitive damages for a violation? Sure, and I don't, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves and spill your thunder on the next slide, so I'm going to try to keep my answer sort of narrow. But um, it, it's a big deal, I guess. I'll start with that. The difference between a negligent violation and a willful violation. Because what we were just talking about a few minutes ago in terms of developing that nexus, the causation, you only that's only required for a negligent violation. So if the plaintiff can establish a willful violation, and the problem is willful is not defined like it is for purposes of punitive damages regularly, it's a very relaxed standard. And frankly, it's hard to win that on an MSJ and the judges punt it to a jury. And if the jury's mad, they're gonna find willfulness. And so it's a really big deal if there's a willful violation because there's no not longer any need to establish that whatever damages you claim happened from this inaccurate reporting say were actually caused by the inaccurate report. The inaccurate report all by itself is a problem. And so you skip over causation entirely and the plaintiff doesn't get much. They get statutory damages, a hundred to a thousand dollars. But they get, even though it's a relaxed standard under willfulness, the punitive damages standard isn't relaxed at all. So the jury still gets to award regular old touchy feely, what do we think it takes to punish the defendant punitive damages? Of course, capped by constitutional issues. It's got to relate sort of to actual damages. And then also the faucet opens on attorney's fees. So what really drives these cases 
and there are some good attorneys on the plaintiff side, and I agree, John, they've gotten very creative, is the attorney's fees. They work up these cases, the good ones that, that sort of are the players. And it is not unusual that by the time you get to trial, you've got a million dollars plus in attorney's fees by the other side. So we're not talking small dollars. And then you add to that the potential for punitive damages, which is a pretty easy road given the relaxed standard of willfulness, no need to prove causation. And then they throw in their emotional distress. Um, now the jury never hears, I, I try to figure out a way to make them hear, but the jury doesn't hear that the attorney's also gonna get attorney's fees or that that's what's motivating this lawsuit. They just think there's poor Mrs. Smith that is so distressed because her credit report is a mess and they award whatever they award and then the judge will give the plaintiff's attorneys their fees, which like I said, can exceed a million dollars. So it's a big deal, that distinction and trying to show um, the client and the business as doing everything it possibly could. So having updated policies and procedures, having a PMK that understands the business and show and tries to sort of draw out the process in terms of what the investigation entailed. Um, very often what I see in deposition is that witness says, and, and the plaintiff gets them to concede, well, it took about a minute for you to confirm whatever the ACDV said with your system. And so we try to back that up and expand that time frame. Well, there's way more that goes into it than that. Your system necessarily pulls from other systems and includes other things. So it doesn't take a minute. Um, and so everything that can be done to show that the what the client did was reasonable, and if anything, the error was negligent, not willful, is a big deal. So yep. before we move on, and uh, yeah. let me, I was going to throw it to you, John, real quick, but just we got, I know we're in the back half of our presentation here, so just very briefly, and then we'll kind of cover our next few topics and get to your, your updates. But John, really would love to hear your perspective on this and kind of what your role is when it comes to um, this sort of issue involving the willful versus negligent and the enhanced damages. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to piggyback off of what Kristen finished with, which is this. The, 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 the way that the, the plaintiff's attorneys try to position the investigation is that it is represented solely by the response by the furnisher. And so they try to convince, you know, everybody who's involved that the ACDV response is, in fact, the investigation. And to fill out an ACDV may take 10 seconds. And I've, I've read deposition transcripts taken by very clever plaintiff's attorneys of the PMK from a furnisher where the PMK repeats over and over and over again, you know, I spend about 30 seconds filling out this form, I spend 10 seconds filling out this form, and it really suggests that the entire investigation took less time than it takes to drink a cup of coffee. And what I try to, I try to be very mindful with furnishers when I'm talking to them, just don't let them drag you down that road because they're dragging you down that road for a purpose. The ACDB response is the product of the investigation, not the investigation. And so it might have taken you 20 minutes of looking through different systems and talking to your peers to come up with a response to an ACDB and five seconds to fill out the ACDB and hit respond. So, I, and, but that's something that a, a clever plaintiff's lawyer will will avoid that side of the discussion and really drag it to just how long it took you to click a few buttons on a form, um, and and it really does paint a, a kind of a distressing picture if if you don't do a good job kind of rehabbing that testimony. Excellent points there. Really, really, really great points. Um, we'll go ahead and and just transition really quick. Um, and you heard Kristen mention the CCRAA a few times uh, in, when, in discussing um, some of the requirements under FICRA. Now, obviously, uh, to me, the FICRA sits at the pinnacle of, of credit reporting regulations, uh, but we can't forget the fact that there's going to be some measure of state law corollaries, too, that businesses need to be mindful of uh, when it comes to compliance, and that could themselves also uh, spawn litigation or could, as Kristen mentioned, piggyback onto FICRA litigation. Um, so, so let's... T touch on those laws because they exist in many states like California, Texas, and New York using California um, as an example. So Kristen, uh, how do laws like the CCRAA stack up to FICRA and, and what should furnishers keep in mind about these differences in state versus federal laws? So, um, and I know based on the attendee list, that there's a bunch of folks from California. So 
Um, for whatever reason, probably to avoid federal court, as some plaintiff's attorneys like to do, I have seen a number of cases filed in California state court under the CCRAA instead of FICRA. And I prefer it. It's better, frankly, for, for a defendant if there's such a thing. Um, there's still attorney's fees, but there is a causation requirement. There's none of this breeze by causation. And the punitive damages are capped. So although they're pretty easy to get, they're capped at $5,000, which is a huge difference versus multi-million dollar awards for punitive damages. Um, there's still the ability to recover for emotional distress, but there's also most of the CCRAA has been preempted by FICRA. So there's no ability to sue for a failure to investigate under the CCRAA. The only suit is really, as to a furnisher at least, is as to um, reporting accurately. So they've only got one shot at it. You defend on it was reported accurately um, or that it was a negligent error or that it didn't cause damages. And it, even if there is um, liability, it's gonna be capped much more significantly than under the FCRA. Got it. Um... I think we could probably spend a, a little bit more time talking about this, but just in the interest of time, because we do have some um, really important kind of updates and developments in the law that have been spawned from the current financial crisis that we're in. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, recent changes to FICRA um, and the new reporting requirements under the CARES Act. So Kristen, uh, this is up on the screen, but could you just really quickly give us an overview of these new legal requirements under the CARES Act and where you see some potential points that may spawn litigation. And then John, I'll tap you to kind of get your insights on this as well. Yeah, so obviously the CARES Act um, came into play just this year with COVID. And the big deal is it amends the FICRA. And so what it says is once there's an accommodation made uh, to a consumer, um, and I'll sort of highlight then what's gonna happen. The, the term accommodation is you can either say it's not defined at all, or it's so broadly defined that anything could qualify, and that hasn't been litigated. And so if the consumer is accommodated and they meet the criteria of that accommodation, then there's an obligation to report that consumer as current, and it's retroactive. So it goes back to January of this year, and it continues until it's probably going to end up being the latter. I think it's 120 days after there's a proclamation that the state of emergency for COVID is done. And so from a business operations standpoint, we haven't seen the litigation yet, but I can just imagine just from the clients I represent, knowing how their business is run, to be able to go back and retroactively change the credit reporting for that person um, if they met the accommodation, it could be a business nightmare. And if you don't do that, you've now violated the FCRA um, still query about whether there's going to be any damages, although, again, you don't need them if it's a willful violation. Um, and so, first of all, what does the word accommodation mean is going to be litigated, I think. I mean, clearly, if you give a loan modification or something like that, it's going to be an accommodation. But something short of that, does it mean accommodation? And then I, I just see the business operational challenges, although the CFPB is supposedly going to be a little lenient because they seem to acknowledge there's going to be business operational challenges. The FCRA doesn't care. So there's no leniency exception under the FCRA. You can still file a lawsuit. Uh, I guess the jury would be the, the ones that would have to be lenient on whether or not they thought it was a big deal. So, uh, so I, I mean, kind of summarizing things a little bit. I mean, obviously, a lot of this is going to come down to what an accommodation is. Um, and it's probably going to be uh, if, if, if the use of legal terms uh, and, uh, and the vagaries in, in what's contained in legislation in, in other contexts, any indication, I think, Kristen, you're absolutely right that we're going to see this be a driver of litigation going forward. Now, John, let me turn to you. Um, do you have any sort of insights from your perspective on whether it be managing compliance? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, when, I'm sorry. Insights from your perspective when it comes to these new requirements. Any insights on what it might mean to provide an accommodation outside of the obvious uh, loan modifications, as Kristen uh, provided as an example? Yeah, I, you know, the interest to me, to me, the word is the, the word that is going to eventually be defined isn't just the word, the, you know, accommodation, but it's also the word relief. 
Because if you read the definition of accommodation, it's this, 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 or relief granted. And so I think you can shoehorn almost anything into the word relief, which would include things that probably were not intended to be accommodations when this provision was drafted. So if you look at things like, you know, the waiving of a late fee, just as a matter of customer service to a longstanding good credit card client, well, that's, you can make an argument that that's relief and therefore you have to change how you've credit reported this particular consumer if you've reported them in any negative status all the way back to January of 2020. Um, and so I, 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 to me, the, to me, and, and look, I was around after the 2008 meltdown and I saw the number of lawsuits that were filed under, um, you know, alleged violations of the FCRA because of how the, the making homes affordable trial payment periods were being reported. Um, and, and I'm not prone to exaggeration, but I can see this becoming a significant driver, not only of single plaintiff FCRA lawsuits, but also class action FCRA lawsuits, because if you've got a really large furniture that is providing hundreds of thousands, if not millions, if not tens of millions of accounts to the credit reporting agencies on a monthly basis, and they think they're doing it right under this very non-specific language in this temporary amendment to the FCRA under CARES, then they may have, you know, you can make an argument that they've done it wrong for everybody, not necessarily just one or two consumers. And so I, I, I see this as being problematic, probably because it's not as it's it's not written well enough to make it more specific to where a furnisher can do these three things and they have complied with their obligations under CARES slash FICRA. Um, and so I, you know, again, I I'm not prone to exaggeration, but I just I see this being a huge problem. And the longer we go, because we have no idea when the cover period is going to end, right? It's it's 120 days after this national declaration expires. That might be the beginning of next year. We also may have a change in administration, and who knows how that's going to affect that. But we may be talking about this cover period lasting a year, two years. Who who knows? And so, it, 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 you know, it's going to be it's going to be interesting to watch and, and and i don't think anybody really has a good handle on exactly what the fallout's going to be i think you're absolutely right on that john and, and thank you for congress for putting out another amendment to a statute with some kind of amorphous term that's just going to spin off a whole bunch of litigation um so uh and of course now we have a, a government regulator stepping in the cfpb thank goodness for them to provide us with some clarity on what this means oh no actually they didn't really do that um so real quick let's touch upon uh, the cfpb's recent statement on these changes to ficra uh, let me throw it to you Kristen, real quick can you give us an overview of this and, and give us your perspective does this provide us any sort of clarity does this have us take any steps forward in understanding what these new requirements really mean. Well, so it doesn't provide any clarity on what John and I have identified as the likely litigation issues. In my view, it doesn't provide any clarity at all on what relief or accommodation means. Um, it is helpful from an enforcement perspective, I suppose, that they at least have articulated a desire to be somewhat lenient. If you look at that sort of fourth quadrant there, that kind of turquoisey one. Um, they said they'll consider the circumstances, and to me that means what the business is dealing with and their good faith efforts to try to comply. Um, maybe you could shoehorn that in into a to defend against a willfulness claim, because one of the defenses for a willfulness claim is, was there some objective reason that what the client was doing was otherwise legal? And so maybe you could argue that they were trying to comply with this, but but no, the short answer is this is not helpful at all. Um, and they, the CFPB, probably because of the complaints, um, issued some additional facts, supposedly clarifications in, I think, June, and it is equally unhelpful in my view. Yeah, it's great. Uh, when you have a, a statute with a private right of action that plaintiff's lawyers can sue on, I doubt it gives very much comfort to know that a regulatory body is going to be lenient um, when we probably shouldn't expect the same level of leniency um, for the plaintiff's bar who has some financial motivation in uh, bringing uh, private enforcement actions. John, um, any, any insights uh, or, or comments on the uh, uh, CFPB's recent statement on uh, the FICRA amendment? Yeah, no, not, nothing. I, I can tell you that anecdotally, I've heard from I, 
But a lot of the social media spaces where I play include a large number of credit repair organizations, and credit repair organizations obviously work with consumers to try to get information removed from their credit reports. In most cases, they're just trying to get bad stuff removed early before the um, period, the, the statute of limitations times out. Um, and, and what I've heard anecdotally from those groups, and probably enough to where there probably is a little bit of truth to this, is that they're seeing their clients are having to wait longer for responses from the consumer reporting agencies vis-a-vis -vis the consumer dispute process, where they may get responses within X number of days. Now it's X plus a week or X plus two weeks. And so one of the one of the interesting things that comes out of this of this issue, and I know the CFPB isn't the FCRA, but is there going to be some sort of protection for the credit reporting agencies if it's taking longer for them to finish their 30 to 45 day reinvestigations? Um, if you know you have so many people that are either laid off or are working from home or otherwise shut down for a period of time because of COVID, and whether or not that there's going to be any leniency in, in that respect. And so I, 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 from my perspective, that's what I'm most interested in is to see what kind of movement there's going to be, given that there may be an increased period of time that it's taking for the industry to process these types of disputes. Yeah, and I think what we're, this is kind of just part and parcel of the general trend that we're seeing um, in terms of being experts and litigators um, it, it, during a financial crisis, which is that uh, changes are, are fast and furious. Um, there is always gonna be something unexpected that comes down the pipeline that no one's ever really dealt with before. Um, but, you know, uh, myself, uh, John, and Kristen were all veterans of the 2008 financial collapse. And I know I realized, I think I thought to myself last year, I was like, boy, I think we're finally done litigating the pipeline of litigation that resulted from the 08 financial crisis. And wouldn't you know it, we turn a dime on 2020 and head straight into another financial crisis. Now, granted, this one is of a different nature. It's, it's spawned by a public health crisis versus a, a true financially uh, born crisis uh, resulting from financial decisions. But nonetheless, I think we can see some parallels uh, in terms of what can be expected. Although the regulations in terms of how, what the government is doing to, to uh, address some of these issues have different contours and, and are different in nature. I think from my perspective, um, I think although there's a dam on it right now, I think we're headed right towards another large wave of litigation under many different consumer statutes. You just think about the different operations that are going to be triggered as a result of number of defaults and things like that. Um, I think it's going to be fairly substantial. I think really highlights the importance of having um, skilled and experienced litigators who have helped other businesses navigate through a similar crisis on your side. So, Kristen, John, let me throw it to you guys. Let me maybe start with Kristen first. Um, in our last few minutes here, um, any comments or thoughts just more holistically or generally on um, what we might see coming down the pipeline from the fallout of the current financial crisis? Yeah, so two things that I noticed from dealing with the lawsuits, and I tried one of the first um, mortgage wrongful foreclosure cases. I don't know what year it was, but after, it was based on the fallout of 08. And what we saw a lot is an understaffing by the clients to deal with the changes. And, and even when they weren't understaffed, there was training issues because it's new and everybody has to learn how to do these different things. And so that's, I, I would think that's gonna happen again because it's all new again in terms of, you're gonna have to go report differently all of a sudden. Um, the good news is um, I, I've tried a decent amount of these cases. We defensed almost, we defensed all of those mortgage cases actually. Um, well, that's not true. Um, almost all of the mortgage cases. And when we were talking to the jurors, although understandably they were very upset and they all knew somebody, if they hadn't been foreclosed on or weren't a product of the um, economic crisis, they knew somebody that they cared about who was. And so they were angry generally at my client. They didn't like my client. But the awards, when there were awards, were not punitive damages awards, they were small. And oftentimes we defense those cases and I've talked to um, some jury consultants recently, and they're just doing sort of some anecdotal mock trial type of things, and they're getting some statistics. And again, I would have expected the anger might translate into um, liability on behalf of the mortgage servicers or banks. And they're finding the same thing, um, that the um, mock jury statistics are defense mostly. So 
if that's truly the trend, that that's potentially good news. Although I think there's going to be some navigating to do from a business operation standpoint. Understood, John. Any any closing insights here? There it is. Sorry, I'm trying to. I mean, so I in, initially when initially when the CARES Act went into place, I thought, okay, so FCRA lawsuits are gonna are gonna reduce a number for a period of time and then they will spike back up well i was i was wrong so if you look at year-to-date fcra lawsuit filings through june of this year the end of june of this year i don't have july data yet but the end of june of this year uh year-to-date we are actually ahead of year of um the same time period in 2019 and while that might not sound terribly exciting or compelling 2019 set a record for the past 10 years for FCRA lawsuits. And so if, so I guess my point is, or the takeaway is, is that even in the middle of COVID-19, um, consumers are still leveraging their rights under the fair credit reporting. And that doesn't include the, the kind, of, kind of a similar trend of FDCPA lawsuits, the CCRAA lawsuits, and just general civil litigation that has some sort of a consumer credit related damage component to it. Um, and so I, I, I think that we are all kind of buckling up, if you will, for what the next year and a half to two years looks like. Thanks, John. Now, I know we're a couple minutes over, but I do notice that we do have one question um, from the audience, which I'll try to quickly field before we close out. And if there's any sort of follow-ups, please feel free to email any of us directly here. We're going to have our, we're going to throw our contact information up on the screen. Um, but the question is, what would it take for you, I presume this means the business, to consider settling emotional distress claims. Psychiatric testimony, while many of these claims may be motivated solely by money, can you not imagine a situation where someone is truly emotionally distressed? And I think that touches on a good point, right? Um, when you spend, uh, like, like you know, Kristen or I have done, or John, and you've involved hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases, um, you kind of see the trends. Uh, and, and I don't want to say that forms a level of, of callousness by any means, but, th but, but it's true. There are certain situations where there is um, you know, that where, where there is genuineness in terms of what the claims are, um, and there are, you know, very, you know, it's not like there's a, a lack of empathy or sympathy, um, but, but at the end of the day, these are ultimately legal disputes, and it's an industry, and it's a business for the plaintiff side as well. And so you do tend to see um, a lot of, um, I, don't, I don't want to say that the claims are necessarily manufactured, but perhaps exaggerated at times, but that's not to rule out the fact that um, that, that there isn't a, a true case of emotional distress. And it really takes a, a skilled lawyer to, uh, to, to be able to identify when that's the case uh, and, and to take the steps necessary to ensure that, the, that there is uh, the right result um, that happens in, in such cases. Um, so uh, I, we're going to go ahead and wrap up the presentation. I know we're about four minutes over here. Before we do that, I want everyone to, uh, to encourage everyone to please we, uh, visit our blog, FICRALAND.com. Uh, we put a lot of great content out on that blog um, where we provide timely updates and insights regarding FICRA. Um, please visit and subscribe. Um, if you need to contact any of us, um, our, our, our contact information is on the screen. So to wrap things up, I wanted to thank my panelists. Kristen, thank you very much. John, thank you very much. I think this has been a really uh, um, exciting and insightful presentation. I hope you audience agree. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you to the ACC again for allowing us to partner with you to put on this presentation um, for your membership. Hope to talk to you all soon.